Welcome back to the Argyle HR Leadership Forum. My name is Eric Wallace with Argyle, and it's great to have everyone joining us today. A couple of notes before I turn things over to our panel moderator. First, a quick reminder to stop by our sponsors' virtual booths at any time during today's event and for the following week. Our partners are committed to providing you with valuable content and a great overall experience. At any time during today's event, you can visit their virtual booths from the main agenda page, which include complimentary materials, information, and meet and greet opportunities. To ask questions during the session, simply type into the Q&A chat and we'll address your questions at the end of the session. Now, without further delay, I'd like to introduce our moderator. Today, we have Rob Markovic, who is Global Vice President, Workforce Planning and Talent Acquisition at PHC. We're excited to have Rob and our panelists for a panel discussion called HR Recovery 2023, Using Technology to Enhance Workforce Innovation. Welcome, Rob, and welcome, panelists. Over to you. All right. Thank you so much, Eric, and thank you, everybody, for having us today. Once again, my name is Rob Markovic. I head up talent acquisition for PHC Group. PHC is a Tokyo-based company in the life sciences and diagnostic space. In addition, I'm on the advisory board for Argyle. And with that, I'll turn it over to Patrick. All right. Good morning, everyone. I'm Patrick C. Daniel. I'm the Chief Human Resources Officer here at General Aviation Terminal, better known as GAT. We're in the aviation airline industry, and we serve as a ground support, ground services partner for all of the airlines throughout the U.S. and Canada. All right. Thank you, Patrick. Eric, over to you. Good morning. I'm Eric Seidel, the Senior Director of Human Resources for Weill Cornell Medical School, the medical school of Cornell University. Um, our parent campus is in uh, central New York. I'm located in midtown Manhattan. Um, and I oversee all aspects of HR for our population of about 10,000 individuals. All right. Thank you so much, Eric. Why don't we go ahead and get started? So we'll read some questions today, and um, our, our panelists will have an opportunity to answer those. And then at the end, we'll, we'll wrap up with questions from the, from the group. So first off, and Eric, I'll throw this one over to you. Can you share a bit about your vendor selection process? Specifically, what are some of the important components to think about, especially as you're rolling out and testing it? Yeah, it's a great question and something that um, I spend probably more time on than I expected to um, when I uh, entered HR as a career. Um, with so many different vendors out there these days, so many different technology solutions coming out, it is essentially important to um, to really do your due diligence and your homework. And, and that really starts partnering with your IT, um, whether that's internal or external, um, to make sure that anything you're looking at will work with your systems, meets your institutional or organizational requirements for um, privacy, safety, um, you know, whatever guidelines you may have in, in place for that. Um, you know, we've had problems uh, in the past as an organization where someone, you know, got very far along in the process with a vendor and then suddenly had to backtrack because either ITS, you know, had issues with some of the um, configuration aspects of it, the privacy aspects, or simply didn't have the, the resources available to do the implementation. So um, I would say, you know, like so many other things, having that conversation early with your technology partners um, is really essential. Um, and then just again, making sure that you're doing your, your, you are doing your general due diligence um, with these vendor partners. You know, again, there's so much out there. It's so easy to put a, a good package together and, and really sell uh, an idea or a service. But, um, you know, we have a responsibility to our organizations and to the people who will be using these technologies, these technology solutions to really make sure that um, what we're offering is, you know, safe, reasonable, um, you know, and adds rather than detracts from, um, you know, the organizational experience. That absolutely makes sense. And as far as getting IT involved, I think that's critical. What about procurement for you? Do you, do you work with your procurement partners? Absolutely. Um, you know, uh, it's another thing that I sort of had to get adjusted to at a larger organization, but um, they were such a fantastic resource for me. One, they have relationships in place already. Two, you know, I'm a former attorney. I, I thought I was pretty good at reading a contract, but these guys, you know, this is what they live and breathe and, and eat and sleep. So they were able to, um, you know, not only help make sure that the contracts met all of our um, requirements and compliance uh, requirements as an organization, but also really to help us get the best deal possible and to make sure that we're covering all aspects that, that maybe I didn't think about since this isn't really what I look at all the time. So, um, you know, definitely taking advantage of those institutional resources, legal as well, um, you know, uh, always taking a look to make sure that there's nothing in there, you know, some something slipped in about jurisdiction or, um, 
grievance procedure that maybe doesn't quite fit with the needs of the organization. So uh, again, it's really something not to be taken lightly um, and, you know, really got to look under the hood, you know, not just at the, at the product or service that's being offered. Absolutely agree. Thank you. Patrick, just quickly, anything you want to add on that? No, I think uh, everything was covered on that. Stage. All right. Very good. I'll go on to the next question. And Patrick, why don't you take this one? What do HR leaders need to keep in mind when deploying HR technology to hybrid workforces? Okay. All right. Uh, let me just kind of paint a picture here. Uh, when you think about our current workforce, we probably have at least four, if not five generations in the workforce, right? You've got everything from baby boomers all the way up to uh, the youngest of young adults in our workforce right now. And I think the first thing to think about is that not one size fits all. I'll say that again, not one size fits all. Um, you know, coming out of the pandemic and moving into a hybrid workforce um, you know, is a shock to the system. You know, I think about the experiences that our employees have had. They went from reporting into work centers and workplaces and manufacturing locations to then going home, right? That was a big shock to the system for a lot of people. And there was a big adjustment that needed to occur, not only for them, but also in terms of the technology needed to support them, the bandwidth, the infrastructure that was needed, et cetera. So now, Organizations are moving back to a hybrid workforce. What does hybrid look like for one? They look different for others. Maybe it's three days in the office, maybe it's one day in, doesn't matter. But then when you start adding the different um, generations of people into the mix and you look at the different learning styles, communication styles, um, personality profiles of folks, one size won't fit all. There are some people that are very high touch. They're extroverted. They need that human contact and that exchange. So whatever platforms you provide for connecting people, looking into a box, looking into a machine, communicating over video may not work. And then you have some folks that, you know, they are just very traditional in the way that they get work done, right? And they're not interested in learning about all the technology that a computer can offer, machine learning, video, um, artificial intelligence, et cetera, right? So it just really creates um, this conundrum. So I would say the, the most important thing is that not one size fits all, understand your employee base and tailor your uh, solution to meet their needs. Patrick, that was a, a huge point. I hadn't even thought of the, the whole concept of generationality and, and how important that is on how people adhere or take on technology in a hybrid workforce. Uh, Eric, I'll turn it over to you. Any other thoughts on that? Anything from your perspective? Yeah, two quick points, Rob. Um, the first, I think, um, you know, I, I agree with everything Patrick said, and I would say there's an additional layer really thinking about role you know, and how that, what the role is, you know, um, both in terms of whether, what the on-site requirements are, you know, I mean, uh, I'm in healthcare, right? We have people who need to be in the office, in the clinic, in the hospital every day. We have people who need to be teaching every day, you know, but we have other folks who who don't need to be and sort of navigating that um, in a way that not only meets the organizational need, but um, sort of recognizes that individuals have preferences and have sort of gotten into habits over the past couple of years, you know, so really thinking about and have strong feelings about whether they believe their role can be performed, you know, offsite, remote, um, you know, with some kind of flexibility. So I think taking that into consideration. And then the other larger picture item would be change management. Um, you know, this is not something that can be you know, just sort of decided and implemented immediately, you know, all of these things, everything that Patrick talked about, some of the other things we'll talk about today, really needs to be part of an overall change management plan that involves um, a high level of communication, training, um, you know, really ensuring that people understand what's happening, why it's happening, how it impacts them, um, and what support is going to be offered to them as they navigate through it. Um, you know, it, it really is something that we haven't always done or not all in organizations have always done or, or done well. Um, when we talk about uh, uh, streamlining HR processes a little bit later, I'll, I'll tell a story about where we didn't do change management well. Um, so I, it really speaks to me as something that, um, you know, has to be front of mind when thinking about something as um, substantive as a, as a change like this or thinking about any kind of new technology rollout. 
I think that's absolutely correct. And um, the whole concept of just change management, but also making sure all the partners that have some touch in there are part of that change management is key. All right, thank you, gentlemen. We'll move on to the next question. And Patrick, this one I'll, I'll send to you as well. Uh, can you give a recent example of how you've used technology to enhance collaboration and teamwork at GAT? Yeah, uh, I guess the story that I would tell, um, it's probably uh, larger than GAT since I've only been here about seven months or so. Um, here you go, but I've walked into a work environment where all of the established platforms of using email, the intranet, uh, the ability to use um, internal chat systems, et cetera, all that stuff is in place. And the other organizations that I work for have made use of these same platforms as well. So I think that's kind of standard, right? But what I really want to pivot toward is kind of the misuse of what it can, what what misuse can look like, right? So let's just take in, in consideration that you've got all of that. You've got email, you've got video, you've got chat, you've got GA, uh, you've got um, uh, AI, you've got all of that stuff, right? Um, but the misuse of it is when folks rely heavily on that um, and don't connect, right? I mean, literally, if you've got people sitting in the same building in the same office or right down the hallway, but they're emailing each other, right? Um, can you imagine the tennis match that goes back and forth, right? A question gets lobbed and then there's an answer, yet it's not sufficient. There's a deeper dive and then there's another answer, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? So it's like, well, pick up the phone and get up and walk and then let's get in the room and let's solve a problem, right? So to answer your question, uh, I think most organizations I've worked for, they've really had all of the technology that you can think of and more. But what's really important is about the use of it, right? If you think about most organizations, um, we're here to solve problems, support employees, serve customers, et cetera. And you have to identify the best ways of doing that. If you're going back and forth on an email exchange, it probably ain't working. That absolutely makes sense. And, and you know, it's interesting. I've, I've been remote for so long and my entire team's remote, but there's so many teams that aren't, but still rely so heavily on technology to communicate versus just in person. So great point. Eric, anything you want to add there? No, I, I think Patrick really, uh, really covered it quite well there. All right. Well, I'll turn the next question over to you then. Uh, can you give a recent example of how you've, how you've used technology to streamline HR processes? Yeah, um, we've done this in a couple of ways, but the one I, that I sort of spoiled, uh, spoiler alert a little earlier was, um, you know, we upgraded our HRIS to sort of the newest cloud-based ver version. Um, you know, we had really been using the server-based version for a very long time. Um, I, 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 I don't think I'm going to mention which system we use, um, but suffice it to say, you know, it was a heavy lift to, um, you know, move and, you know, get everybody ready for the cloud-based version. Um, you know, the, the benefits were obvious, right? You know, moving away from forms, away from attachments, and, and really creating a system that was much easier for anybody to use wherever they're sitting, you know, as long as they're in front of a computer. Um, we're not quite at the mobile technology aspect of it yet, but that may be coming. Um, you know, and and I think the decision to do this was made actually before I joined the organization, and it certainly made sense. But to the point I was making earlier, where we really dropped the ball, I think, was on the change management piece, you know, really, um, you know, ensuring that everybody knew what was happening, why it was happening, um, and what it was going to mean for their daily existence. Um, we are, we've actually had a similar situation with, um, we have a separate sort of standalone time card, timekeeping system um, that we've been implementing over a very long period of time to go from essentially still paper time cards to, you know, to electronic. And um, especially in the clinical practice setting, which I would imagine is similar to, you know, lots of other sort of on-site settings like factories or other, you know, sort of more uh, manufacturing type things as well. You know, people don't have the time during the day to sort of, you know, take care of some of these administrative things. So we tried to make it easier. We tried to make it streamlined, but, um, but again, really did not do a good enough job of, uh, you know, educating everybody, bringing them along on the ride. And then we've had to do so much cleanup afterwards. Um, so the takeaway there obviously is, you know, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Um, and, you know, certainly in the medical industry that resonates for us as well, um, or even more so. 
But again, you know, I, I firmly believe that we made the right to decision to move to a, a cloud-based system and to add that increased functionality and efficiency. Um, but again, my my sort of uh, moral of the story is, you know, make sure you're doing it in a right way so that you're bringing everybody along with you rather than, um, you know, doing it in a, in a less than efficient or less than ideal way. Yeah, it's amazing how much it comes back to change management, regardless of how sophisticated the technology is or yeah. the ease of use, doesn't matter. All right, very good. Patrick, anything to add there? No, nope, I think Eric covered it very well. All right, very good. Uh, next question then, and Patrick, this one to you, please. What are some things that HR professionals can do to build support across the business? for adopting new technology? We understand it for HR, but what about the business itself? How can we support them? Yeah, um, I think the theme of change management has kind of been uh, central and core here. Um, and, you know, when you start thinking about an overall business, you know, if you're not innovating, you're not growing, um, you know, you're really not kind of getting ahead of the curve. So that should be a central theme that uh, all business leaders um, should tout and espouse and get out in any of their town hall conversations and let people know that, right? So then when you think about kind of the HR community, we are cheerleaders of that. We are, um, we are advocates for that change management. We talk about it. We talk about kind of the technology that's around the corner that will support the business, whether it's workforce management and planning, whether it is um, type, some type of sales pipeline, et cetera. What if, what, uh, you know, it could be a learning management solution, et cetera. You know, you always want to uh, see the organization with the notion that we are innovative, you know, we're growth oriented, and that we're always looking to make use of smart technologies and things that help uh, our culture, our employee base, and help our business and our customers grow and evolve. So I think that that's a message that not only HR carries, but all of the business leaders within an organization, they have to do their job to make sure that they're espousing those as well. I, I think that's a good point. One of the things that we've struggled with at, at my company and, and at other companies I've been at is how that gets flowed down, I guess, throughout the organization. A lot of times we rely on business leaders to flow down and that doesn't always happen. Have you had that happen and and how did you counteract that? Yeah, it's a cascade, right? So, you know, if you think about the exercise, you know, in a room and this goes way, 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 way back. You got 20 people in a room. One person reads the message, then they have to relay it to the next person and the next person. By the time you get to the end of the line, the message may have changed, right? So, you know, it's kind of like a one pager, you know, an executive summary is, has three to five bullet points on it, right? And the idea is to continue to share that message with the leadership team members who then cascade it down, who cascade it down, but the messaging should have the same look, feel, and, um, you know, kind of examples, you know, that's consistent throughout the messaging, right? So it really is pushing it, pushing it, pushing it, and holding people accountable to make sure they got that message. And one way that you can evaluate that is if you're walking through the hallway and you see somebody at the cooler that is lower in the organization, or you happen to be able to video with them, say, hey, did you get that message about X, Y, and Z? And they'll say, yeah, I got the message. Okay, tell me about that. And then they'll tell you, or oh, no, I never got the message, et cetera. Now you know who to go back to to hold them accountable. Plus, you can reinforce the message right there on the spot. I think that follow-up is key and, and certainly, certainly helps identify where you have problems in the organization on communication. So, all right, thank you for that. Uh, actually, the next question I'm going to give to you as well, Patrick, what are some things to keep in mind as we train employees on new technology? Okay, if you notice the themes when I talk about stuff, you know, the easy part is having the technology, right? And doing the intended stuff, right? But as an HR practitioner and leader, I've been conditioned to look at what can go wrong, right? And so I'm going to take it from that tack, right? The misuse of it, right? So if you think about uh, the HR community and, and all business leaders really need to be concerned about, you know, protecting the privacy of people, not using information in an untoward or negative way. 
uh, not doing things that are unethical or things that go against a code of conduct, if you will, right? The biggest thing about training is, you know, understanding any unintended consequence and also that you're monitoring and putting together a compliance protocol that if and when people misuse the technology, what happens as a consequence, right? You know, so again, you've got 100 people, 99 are going to use it the proper way. But inevitably, there is that one employee, as a metaphor, who's going to deliberately and intentionally misuse it, whether it's a cellular phone and uh, an inappropriate picture is shared. It's kind of a, a benign way, right? But you start thinking about AI and you start thinking artificial intelligence and machine learning, et cetera, right? Um, you know, I think it's, 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 it's quite known that, you know, you can use some of those technologies to actually weed out certain applicants or candidates, right? Now, just imagine if you have people that are deliberately and intentionally doing that. Now they're putting the organization at risk. Now they're creating harm to the organization, right? So when we think about the training of it, not only how to use it and how to use it properly, but also uh, make sure you don't want to file of using it in a way that is going to negatively impact the organization and or you personally, I think are some key things as a part of the training. Yeah, that's a, a huge point. Uh, I think we'll dive into compliance here a little bit further in a minute because that's that's so key to everything that we do uh, and, and helping with that. I think the other point that was interesting to me that you brought up was this whole concept of, of how we train people and how we think about the tool itself is the tool, but how do we actually get there and make sure people understand how to use it and use it the appropriate way? All right, thank you for that. Eric, anything to add on that before I move on to your question? Um, actually, yeah, just picking, piggybacking on the point you just made, Rob, you know, I think, um, and, and actually calling back to the point Patrick was making earlier about sort of the diversity of the workforce, both in terms of generation as well as other aspects, you know, um, really thinking about the different training modalities, right? Not everybody learns in the same ways, and especially if you have a, a, a workforce that's dispersed over, you know, um, you know, quite a distance with people in different time zones, you know, people on site versus remote versus hybrid, you know, really making sure that um, your training materials and your training modalities, you know, will reach everybody. Um, you know, some people will be fine with, you know, uh, traditional frontal, you know, uh, instructor led learning, other people need more hands on approach, some people really resonate, some people really uh, prefer, you know, coaching sessions, um, you know, or written materials in that sense. So I think having everything, and then again, to Patrick's point, making sure that the, the content is the same, the bullet points are the same, the takeaways are the same, but that they're being presented in a way that um, really reaches everyone, no matter who they are or, or how and where they're situated uh, you know, throughout the organization. I just think that's really an important thing to keep in mind as well. Yeah, especially with the remote workforce and, and how, that, how that resonates. All right, very good. Well, why don't we go ahead and, and jump into some of that compliance piece. Eric, there's, there's a couple questions here. I'm, I'm going to combine them. I'll read both and, and just take your time answering them, but they're around compliance, cybersecurity, things like that. So first one is what is involved in with keeping HR technology secure from cyber attacks. So this is HR technology specifically. And then the next piece on this, I think it's related is how can HR leaders make sure that they're maintaining regulatory compliance as they launch new HR technologies? Yeah, um, in both cases, the, the very oversimplified answer is to rely on the experts, you know, to recognize that, you know, we know a lot about compliance in HR, but, you know, there are aspects of this, especially around technology, where we are not the experts and we need to bring those experts in, whether that's IT, whether that's, you know, an external vendor, trusted vendor, um, whether that's legal um, in that case. You know, I'll, I'll give you an example. We're actually looking at a new technology right now. Um, you know, New York City has uh, some laws, uh, some new laws around the use of AI and talent uh, acquisition, you know, making sure that it's being done in a non-discriminatory non -discriminatory and appropriate way. Um, at the same time that we have an explosion of technology coming out to help talent teams, you know, do a better and more efficient job of finding the right talent for all of the open positions that we have. Um, so we have had conversations not only with you know, the various vendors we've looked at who have technology solutions, but 
also with um, sort of our uh, our separate partners on our, uh, you know, we're a federal contractor, so we have um, AAP requirements, you know, so we've actually spoken with them. We've asked them to do some additional sort of objective vetting for us of some of these other platforms that we're looking at. Of course, we've looked, we've talked to our technology people as well, um, and we brought legal into the conversation from the very beginning to make sure that we fully understand what the laws, in this case, you know, the New York City laws specifically state and you know how we can make sure that we understand what's required of us and how to be compliant. So it really is. It really does take a village, um, you know, to 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 uh, bring a new technology on board like this, um, and recognizing what we don't know, um, and then helping getting the people involved to help us get those answers. Um, you know, I would be very foolish if I thought I knew everything or knew enough to make this decision unilaterally. Um, you know, or even just from, from an HR perspective. Um, you know, and just like HR, you know, really operates to support the business needs and goals of the organization, um, you know, we need to rely on the expertise within the organization and from our outside partners to help us make sure that we're doing this in the most, um, you know, in the safest uh, and most compliant way. Um, the, the risks are just too great otherwise. Eric, you brought something up near and dear to my heart when you started talking about talent acquisition technology. It's not just technology. And to your point, there's so many complexities. Number one, well, it is technology, but not something that you necessarily onboard like chat GPT. You have no idea if your people are using it. And if they are, if they're being compliant or thinking about how that affects the, the candidate population for talent acquisition, for example. Uh, the other piece of it, which is why you have to stay so close to legal and why you have to stay so close to compliance is, to your point, city laws, state laws, anything can change that could have an effect on the technology that we're using. And if we're not aware of it, we may not be in compliance and not even know it. So that whole dig on really partnering, working together and explaining the risks and the rewards of the, the tools that we use are, are, are just completely key. So thank you for that. Patrick, anything to add on that one? No, I think Eric covered it quite well. <clears throat> All right, very good. Well, at this point, I'm going to turn this question over to both of you, and it's and and Patrick, if you don't mind going first, what HR technology insight do you know now that you wish you would have known a year ago? Yeah, um, you know, around the corner and around the curve, we all look. We try to understand, you know, where the hockey puck is going instead of just, you know racing toward it. Um, for me, and I think the organizations that I've worked in, it is about kind of chat GPT and artificial intelligence, right? I think that we're at the first layer of uh, peeling the onion and we kind of understand at a surface level what its capability and its use cases are, but we have no idea how deep and how pervasive and how explosive this technology uh, has grown and will grow. Um, would have been nice to know that a year ago um, because a lot of planning and organization design and modeling um, could have taken place around the anticipation of what the use cases are turning out to be. Absolutely agree. Absolutely agree. All right, Eric, what about you? Any, any, Anything you wish you would have known a year ago that you know now? Uh I mean, the first one that comes to mind is the same one Patrick just shared. I mean, I can say now we have, you know, university wide committees that are looking at, you know, the use of AI and, and chat GPT across both, you know, the academic setting across, um, you know, administrative settings as well, both from the um, how do we as an institution of higher education, you know, um, protect ourselves, you know, from students or researchers, you know, using it in, in uh, or misusing it, uh, to Patrick's point earlier. Um, but on the other side, how can we as an organization use it to our benefit, you know, use it in the work that we're doing? Um, you know, I think the other piece for me, it's not quite new, maybe not a year ago, but um, sort of the explosion of social media, uh, the use of social media as a talent acquisition tool, both for outreach but also for, you know, as a way for candidates to, um, to reach out, to communicate, to gather information, um, and thinking about both the opportunity there, um, but also the risks associated with it. Um, and, and the risks are so broad, you know, when we think about um, every, or, every employee within the organization is a brand, 
representative of that organization. And if we all have social media platforms, you know, despite policies, despite, you know, protections that may be in place, you know, what we put out there in the world reflects on our organization as well as us as individuals. Um, and there's a there's an impact from a just even just thinking narrowly on talent in that aspect, you know. Um, so I think really taking that into consideration and thinking about how we are going to approach talent acquisition, how we're going to approach, um, you know, information sharing um, and, and sort of bi-directional communication with people outside our organization through the use of social media is, um, I think it's a much bigger, um, it's a much bigger elephant in the room than we even thought it was going to be um, in that sense. So I, I wish you, I had, you know, if I'm, if I'm looking back and had a crystal ball, I'd say, you know, even more thought and creativity and um, safeguards, guardrails around that um, would probably help me sleep a little bit better at night. Yeah, I, I can't agree with you more. I think uh, the pace at which social platforms come out and, and how we have our policy set for specific platforms, but maybe not all platforms that come out and, and how employees or candidates or whoever engage in those it's it's a lot to think about and and i think about that a year ago that would be something i wish i i would have had a little bit more insight into so all right on that note i want to thank both of our panelists this is a great discussion really appreciate that before we go to questions i just want to turn it over one more time any last thoughts patrick or eric from either of you uh on on this topic today before we we go into the questions no last thoughts from me all right thank you I'll just say, you know, technology will continue to evolve and, uh, you know, hopefully we can we can keep up with it, uh, you know, through forums like this, discussions like this, networking with our colleagues, uh, regardless of industry, um, you know, and sharing information in a productive way. Um, you know, I know I learn a lot from my um, from my colleagues in other industries, as well as, you know, those in, in the same setting uh, I am in. Um, so I very much appreciate the openness that I've always found within the, the HR leadership community. Yeah, totally agree. All right, on that note, we're going to switch over to questions. So first off, audience, thank you so much. There's so many great questions in here, and some of them are fairly complex. So I'm going to do my best to read the questions, and then I'll turn them over to Patrick and Eric to answer. Uh, if either one of you have a preference on who answers, just jump right in, please. All right, so the first question is, I have had friends who are starting to see a lot of resignations due to a role that was once remote due to COVID, and is now requiring those individuals to be on site. Are there other companies seeing this as an issue? My company has seen some, but not at the level as my friend. So Patrick, Eric, either one of you, please. Yeah, forward. I'll jump into that. I think that that is a, a natural phenomenon that organizations are seeing. So let me talk about it, right? You got to think about the shock wave. It went both ways. People were Coming into the office, they were working nine to five and making up traditionally, right? They were interacting with people. On or around March, April, 2020, maybe May, everyone was sent home, right? That was a huge shockwave, right? It was like people were carrying boxes. There weren't, you know, there were desktops and people trying to figure out how to take it home. There was bandwidth. Uh, I don't have internet because I live out in a remote place. How do I get another router, get another server? You know, there's a family of four that are gathered in the house because the college students are now around the, you know, dining room table and mom and dad or whomever, they're at home and people are trying to coexist. I mean, it was a huge shockwave, right? We went from zero to 100 in a quantum leap, right? So then... You know, as people evolved, they kind of got into it and they got used to it and they start seeing kind of the benefits of it and, you know, actually can do more things around the house, more social, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So they've gotten used to it. And so now some organizations are saying, all right, everybody come back, you know, and now it is another quantum leap in the other direction. And others are looking at more of a meter pace on kind of a hybrid, et cetera, et cetera, right? So People are, have a different way of adjusting to that. And a natural outcome of that is, you know what? No, I don't want to do that. Why would I go back into an office when these other organizations allow me to work remotely, right? And so you see the resignations. So I think it's an ebb and flow. It's a give and take that you're going to see, you know, all across organizations. People are going to resign because they're used to working remotely. 
you, you can go out and you can acquire great talent because people crave to come back into an office environment and have what that stability looks like, right? So it's a give and take. So the answer to the question is, it's happening everywhere, it's not unique to me. Yeah, I agree. And and I uh, I would say um, one, one of the things I've seen that definitely um, troubles me is, so again, this sort of blanket statement that everybody needs to be back just because, you know, what I think resonates a lot better is that, we you know, we want people to come back, that, that there's a rationale, right, that there's a well thought out rationale. People may not agree with it, but at least there has to be some thought process, some justification for why people are coming back in, if it's a role that could be done remotely, has been done remotely for some period of time. Even if the rationale is team building, even if the rationale is this particular type of meeting functions better or is more productive when it's face to face as opposed to, you know, over Zoom. I think if you give people a legitimate, defendable reason as to why they're being asked to come in on some basis, they will be more likely to accept it and then try to find that balance. You know, again, when, when people are being asked to come in just because or just because we want to go back to the way things were. That's, I think, where you're seeing a lot of people push back because they know they can do their job. They've been doing their job remotely for this whole time and feeling productive and, and you know, contributing to the organization. So um, I just think we have to recognize, you know, um, that that it was such a quantum shift, you know, to Patrick's point and and realize that people are not dumb. You know, they understand that, you know, if, if they'll understand whether there is a reason or not for them being asked to come back in. Absolutely. And hence, hence uh, kind of the not one size fits all. Right. You know? And uh, it's not binary. The connecting word between is and, A-E-N-D, right? It's not either or, it's and. Find the and. Huge point, huge point. I think the thing that uh, comes through for me from both of you is this whole concept of, of our entire conversation today, change management. It's all in how you manage the change and, and set the expectations for the change. So, all right, very good. Let's go on to another question. Um, we are struggling to transition our workforce management work to cloud-based software. Do you have any advice for us? Um, I'll start with this one. I think, you know, we, we touched on some of this already. Um, you know, technology concerns, you know, that you certainly want to vet with your IT experts, um, you know, legal and compliance issues, privacy issues are sure, you know, at all while assuming that you have an understanding of, you know, what the impact on workflow efficiency productivity will be. Um, it, it's not something to do just because everybody else is doing it. I think you really need to have a good case as to what will improve and how much is that improvement likely to be worth to your organization and the people of your organization. And then again, change management, having a really solid, well thought out and well executed change management plan so that people understand what's changing, how it impacts them um, and how they're gonna be supported throughout that change. Makes sense. Patrick, anything to add there? N nothing to add other than the fact that just add to explain to people why it's changing. Right. That helps people with the change management experience also. Yeah. Just outside of the change management piece of it, I think workforce planning is a difficult period. Yeah. And and switching over to cloud-based workforce planning is also difficult. So everybody has to be on board. So so back to what both of you gentlemen just said. All right. The next question is somewhat complex. I think we have time for this. We'll try and get to everything else, but I'll, I'll give this one a go. Um, with the increase in Microsoft Teams utilization, we are seeing employees reach out to us through Teams instead of email. Mainly they are, are using Teams to get immediate responses. With access to management through these platforms, um, which are easier, how do you mitigate using these types of platforms to address the needs of employees but not get overwhelmed over the increase in volumes of messages um, coming out from the field. Okay, I'll, I'll take a stab at it. So okay. I don't want to just focus on Microsoft Teams. It could be Google, it could be any type of software, any type of vehicle that employees are using to try to access members of management, et cetera, right? I think that was kind of the nature of it that there's an increased use of this. So when you start thinking about solving a problem, particularly a complex problem, uh, an involved problem, use the use of an email or a chat is not gonna be most effective. It requires a conversation. 
And so it doesn't matter whether it's Teams or if it's Google or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Anything that turns into more than two serves over the net <laughs> with the email or the message, that's an in-person conversation that's wanted to have to happen, right? You know, particularly if someone is using that to deal with employee relations issues or questions, you know. So, Eric, uh, my boss is being mean to me. What advice would you give me? So what are you going to say back to me, Eric? Let's have a meeting. Come and meet with me or let's get on. No, the no, no, no. That's too easy. No, no, no. <laughs> Play the other side. Oh, like, okay. Oh, what's, going what's going on? Tell me what's going on. Well, and now, so it turns into an eight pager. So now respond back to me. Right. At that point, I'm going to say, let's come in and have a meeting in person or over the phone. Right. But a lot of times you don't see someone cut that off. You'll see the body go back yeah. and forth, back and forth. And as we know, things can get misinterpreted at that point. So that's how I would respond to it. Have the in-person conversation. Don't allow the tool of the technology to replace having a conversation around a, a significant or involved uh, issue. Yeah, I agree. I, the only thing I would add is for other things that maybe don't necessarily require a conversation or that could be delegated to an appropriate person, right? If it's an employee relations issue, you know, I'm going to make sure to connect that employee with the appropriate person on the employee relations team, right? You know, I mean, so it, it's a it's a little bit of a diversion, but it also is more effective or efficient at getting them the answer that they're specifically looking for from the subject matter expert within the organization. Um, ticketing systems often are a great thing. You know, we have a really good ticketing system within HR, um, our solution center where, you know, we direct people there all the time and they are the clearinghouse for questions and comments that come in so you know people don't always love it at first when you direct them that way but hopefully it works the way that it should they get the answer that they want they feel heard um you know and then they'll start using it again in the future so having those alternate routes where you can redirect someone and then they actually get what they need can help sort of manage it more long term whereas i think patrick is spot on in terms of how to deal with it in the moment when those questions are coming in uh, and, and you can't necessarily uh, avoid them all right. All right. Very good. I think just uh, a final thought on that is, uh, you know, number one, in person could be over Teams, right? It's just not the Teams chat. It's it's video and talking. Yep. Uh, number two, something that I've I've noticed a lot is is with more and more usage of 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 chat platforms, you see a lot of skipping over the person's manager to go to the manager's manager, things like that. So I think it's important for all of us to remember and realize that we have to keep everybody in the loop if you're beginning to answer questions on Teams for one of your manager's employees or, or the like. All right, on that note, I think we are just about at time. Once again, thank you both our panelists, Patrick and Eric. Great conversation today. Really appreciate your candor, your openness to share things that have gone right and wrong and and, and your thoughts on these topics. Uh, Eric Wallace, with that, I'll turn it back over to you. Great. Thank you, Rob, Patrick, and Eric for that insightful panel discussion. I want to thank everyone else in the audience also for joining us today. This session, along with all of today's content, will be available on demand following the event. Thanks very much.